This is Section 8, All Weather Systems, Unit 44, Geothermal Heat Pumps. Reverse cycle refrigeration. Geothermal heat pumps use the earth or water uh, in the earth as heat sources and heat sinks. Uh, heat pumps utilize uh, the energy stored in the earth's crust for heating. Air conditioning loads are transferred to the earth can be used for space heating as well as cooling. They utilize a compressor, condenser, evaporator, metering device, and a four-way reversing valve. Geothermal heat pump classifications. The first one would be the open loop system. That would be a water source heat pump. Water is used as the heat transfer medium. The water then is expelled back to the earth typically uses a well, a lake, or a pond. Needs a large volume of clean water to operate properly. Geothermal heat pump classifications. Uh, the closed loop system utilizes the earth coupled system. The same heat transfer fluid is reused. The fluid is circulated and buried in plastic pipes used where the water is rich in minerals. Uh, local codes prohibit open loop systems. Not enough water exists to support an open loop well water system. Might be adaptable in our drought uh, driven climate here. Open loop system. Heat is transferred between the water source and the air from the space. Uh, water then is expelled back to the earth. In the heating mode, heat is transferred from the water source to the conditioned space. In the cooling mode, heat is removed from the conditioned space and deposited into the water. Open loop heat pump. So basically, if you'll notice over here, uh, this represents a cooling tower here, obviously. Here we have the induced draft blower, the fan, which is going to circulate air and to cause the uh, moisture that is uh, collected on these eliminator plates to uh, release the heat and of course the water which comes from the uh, system uh, the uh, droplets will condense and then collect in the water sump and in addition for the water that is evaporated in the atmosphere we have a water sump so here in this open loop water source heat pump with a boiler and cooling tower uh, to maintain the loop temperature so here's heat pump number one number two number three part of this loop mechanism so basically we're going to go through this heat pump. We're going to follow these arrows. We're going to come up here to the wetted surface of the cooling tower. And of course, the heat that was picked up in the heat pump is going to be rejected here in the cooling tower. You have a spray header. And basically, that spray header is going to take and um, spray the water, which is collected here in the sump, and of course, cooling off the uh, um, the um, wetted surface of this uh, uh, cooling tower that in turn is going to cause condensation of course the water is going to fall back into the sump and again we have our float water makeup valve here then we go here to the boiler we have a hand valve as well as a mixing valve the boiler is used to take and temper the water to make sure we have the high enough temperature for this heat pump system to work there's a mixing valve to mix the uh, boiler hot water along with the water that's circulated to increase the temperature. Then we go through an air separator to remove the air non-condensables which have collected in the cooling tower. And then of course we're going to pump this back into the heat pump. So an open loop water source heat pump with boiler cooling tower will uh, remember to, uh, to maintain the loop temperature. More about this a little bit later. Water quality. Most important factor to consider when dealing with open loop systems that rely on well water. Three most important questions you have to ask yourself. Number one, will the well deliver enough water in gallons per minute GPM to the heat pump? What is the temperature of the well water? Number three, is the well water clean and low in minerals? If it's high in minerals, you got a problem. Water quality. System comp components, the heat exchangers use, utilize what they call the counterflow principle, allows the water to flow in one direction and the refrigerant to flow in the other. 
I've taught this in my previous classes, and counterflow is an extremely important uh, item in order to maximize heat transfer. Uh, heat exchangers are coiled, coaxial, tube within a tube. Water flows through the inner tube made of copper or cooper nickel, which is basically a um, metal compound which resists salt water corrosion. We utilize this aboard ships, both in the Navy and the civilian side of the fence. Uh, have uh, leads uh, that improve leads. Uh, I'm sorry, that improve heat transfer. Refrigerant flows through the outer jacket made of steel. Closed loop systems utilize ground loops or water loops. Low wattage centrifugal pumps uh, circulate the water or uh, antifreeze solution through the buried plastic pipe. In the heating mode, the heat is transferred from the ground through the pipe, through the liquid, uh, to the liquid uh, in the ground loop. In the cooling mode, the heat is rejected from the circulating fluid through the pipe and into the ground. All right, this is a closed loop system here. You don't see that much here in California. It's popular in the Midwest and the eastern part of the United States. A ground loop shows a series of vertical configuration in the heating mode. And basically, the heat is being absorbed from the ground into the circulating fluid inside that pipe. So basically, if we start with the house, and now we have a pump inside somewhere. We're going to circulate the fluid, which is going to absorb heat here from the ground. As it absorbs heat, the water will heat up and then coming through this ground loop system eventually finds its way into the house. Notice that we don't use no boilers and uh, the ground does contain heat, believe it or not. And this system works extremely well for heating a house. Um, maintenance is extremely low. I would say probably the only pitfall is the front up, the upfront cost of installing this ground loop system initially. But if it's installed correctly, it should last many years and do a very good job. Closed loop systems, parallel vertical configuration, figure 44.8. The ground loop shows a parallel vertical configuration in the cooling mode. So. Uh, we have uh, heat which came from the house is being rejected from the circulating fluid into the ground loop uh, uh, to the ground, okay? And as this is circulated, uh, needless to say, so we've got, it appears to be two loops here. So you have one loop right here, and basically uh, this is not interconnected. Well, this is kind of strange. So you have one loop on this. Okay, so you have actually two loops here. So one here and one here. So as we give up the heat from the house into the uh, ground, we have another loop which picks up uh, the uh, temperature. It takes and picks up the uh, a cool. The water cools off, and in this case, uh, we have the ability to take and run uh, a form of chill water back into the structure and cool the house down in this case. Closed loop systems, energy exchange. The circulating fluid exchanges its energy with the refrigerant loop. Uh, the heat exchange takes place within the heat pumps, antifreeze to refrigerant heat exchanger. The heat exchanger cannot get foul because it's treated water. The air loop is used to distribute conditioned air utilizes a fin coil air to refrigerant heat exchanger located in the ductwork. Closed loop systems, domestic water. Domestic water can be heated by compressor discharge gas, requires a separate heat exchanger. Domestic water is circulated by a pump, utilizes a counter flow tube within a tube heat exchanger. Remember the uh, fluids off, flow in an opposite direction for maximum heat transfer. The uh, hot gas is desuperheated while the water is heated. Ground loop configurations and flows. The vertical systems used when there is a shortage of land. Uh, horizontal systems used when land is available without hard rock. 
uh, a slinky loop, never heard of this before, flattened circular coil of plastic pipe resembling a slinky. Uh, for you guys that have been around a while, slinky is a toy. Um, I remember seeing them as a kid. I hate to tell you how many years ago, uh, but it's uh, north of 50. <laughs> and they're still around as far as I know. Designed to reduce the uh, trench length, can be installed in lakes and ponds. Round loop configurations, flows, and series flows. Only one path for the fluid to flow. Advantages, the ease of removing trapped air, simplified flow path, high heat transfer per foot of pipe. Disadvantages, need a larger pipe, more antifreeze solution, higher installation cost, higher pressure drops. Ground loop configurations and flows, parallel flow, the advantages, smaller diameter and lower cost piping, lower installation labor cost, less antifreeze required, disadvantages, difficulty in removing air and ground loops because of the parallel pass. Balancing problems if the uh, piping is of unequal length or unequal resistance. Ground loop configurations, flows, parallel flow, Advantages, smaller diameter, lower cost piping, uh, lower installation, labor costs, less antifreeze, difficulty removing air in the ground loops because of the parallel pass, balancing problems is of unequal length. I believe I read this slide before. Pardon me about that. Okay, different flow paths. Uh, different flow paths in the ground loops. Okay, if you look up here, we have what they call the series vertical loop up here. Nothing really uh, great and uh, hard to figure out. Here we have a parallel vertical loop. Notice that we have two loops here, okay? Uh, and this is a little bit obviously more piping. Then we have a series horizontal. Instead of going vertical, now we go in a horizontal. This requires more real estate in order to make this happen. Parallel horizontal, this is a little bit more piping involved here. So these are different paths and ground loops, and it really depends on how much room is available to install this, and if the building codes allow you to do this depending on the area that you're proposing to put this in. System materials and heat exchange fluids. Buried pipe usually made of polyethylene or polybutylene. I'm sorry, butylene. If there is not a threat of freezing in the ground, pure water can be used in the ground loops. Choice for antifreeze solutions, uh, salts, calcium chloride, sodium chloride, glycols, ethylene glycol, and propylene glycol, alcohols, methyl, methyl isopropyl, and ethyl. Now the problem with these, uh, these different uh, antifreezes, this piping better be really tight and not subject to uh, breakage because this could contaminate and create uh, problems with groundwater if these chemicals are allowed to leach outside of this ground loop. So it's important if you're utilizing these uh, chemicals uh, as far as your antifreeze in order to prevent freezing in the winter time, it's very important that this piping is constructed in such a way that um, breaks hopefully will not occur and contaminate the surrounding earth. System materials and heat exchange fluid system components must be chosen carefully uh, when they are used with salts, glycols, and alcohols. I just uh, sp uh, spelled that out just a minute ago. Premixed geothermal loop fluids have a great antifreeze, anti-corrosive, and heat transfer properties. R410A is the leading alternative to replace R22 new equipment. Uh, this slide was made years ago, and of course, R22 is gone, and uh, R410A right now is the industry standard. Other alternative refrigerants are available. Always follow the manufacturer's retrofit guidelines. Geothermal wells and well sources, drilled wells, uh, are equipped with submersible water well pumps. Water comes from an underground aquifer. Uh, discharge water can be directed into the lakes or streams. Most wells are grouted, 
to prevent water contamination and rusting. Cement-like material is injected between the well casing and the hole drilled for the well. So basically, we are just drawn on an existing water aquifer and utilizing uh, uh, the water, in this case, for geothermal uh, heat pumps. Geothermal wells and water sources, return wells, return discharge water back to the ground, should be located at least 100 feet away from the supply well to prevent early mixing of the supply and return water. Mixing of the water could seriously affect the capacity of the heat pump. So we want to make sure that the split between the supply and return is far enough away so we don't raise the overall temperature of this uh, geothermal heat pump system. Otherwise, it will hinder the performance of it. Okay, here we have a return well system. It's in your textbook, page, it's on figure 44.21. Notice that we have two wells here. Here we have a well where we're drawing um, underground water through this well. And we have a pump here, a submersible pump, which is going to take and um, draw this water into this system. We are going to put it inside this vault in a pressurized tank right here, like in the basement. And then basically this pressurized tank um, will, um, uh, will take and increase the pressure. Uh, also acts as a holding uh, storage unit. And we have a hand valve. Then of course we have the actual heat pump. Then we have a slow closing uh, solenoid valve and then a hand valve. So basically as it runs through this system right here, uh, what is going to happen is the heat that is picked up inside the structure is going to be rejected to the well water. The well water in turn is going to take and go into this uh, return well system. So the temperature of the water in the return is obviously going to be higher than the temperature of the water uh, coming in from the well. I can tell you from uh, working on a farm in North Dakota as an example, we utilized well water uh, extracted from the ground. That water is very, very cold. Typically that water is going to be in the 40 degree temperature range. So uh, just from a personal experience, I remember pumping this water by hand as a kid on a farm and the water was, we never had to refrigerate well water because it was so cold coming out. Uh, one of the things that uh, would make this advantageous, the water is already cold and basically you're taking a portion of this water and circulating it into this uh, uh, geothermal uh, heat pump source and it will do a great job of extracting heat as long as this water here of course is available. Geothermal wells and water sources return line solenoids. It prevents water hammer, keeps the heat exchanger and pressure tank equal during the off cycle. helps keep the minerals dissolved in the water. We don't want the minerals uh, settling out of the water because they'll collect on the metal piping and everything else, and it will create a heat transfer ba uh, barrier in the geothermal uh, well system. Return or drop pipe must end below the static water level in the well, the level to which the water will rise in a well as it naturally seeks its own level. So if you put this thing up too high, that you have a uh, tendency to make this thing airbound, but you have to locate the uh, piping uh, in the well in such a way that will ensure positive water flow. Geothermal wells and water sources. Geothermal wells, again, I draw water from the top of the water column, circulate it through the heat pump, return at a different temperature to the bottom of the water column used where there's not enough water in the underground aquifer to use uh, other standard well systems. Geothermal wells and water sources are dry well used for the discharge of water into, in, in an open loop system. Basically large reservoirs filled with gravel and sand. Water is filtered as it seeps through the gravel. Water then is returned to the un, uh, underground aquifer. Geothermal wells and water sources, pressure tanks. 
used on well systems, open loop geothermal heat pumps. Small pressurized tank for water storage prevents the well pump from short cycling. The well pump fills the pressure tank to a predetermined pressure, then shuts off. Cycles on again when the pressure drops. Tank should be sized so the pump starts no more than once every 10 minutes. So it should be large enough so this thing's not running continuously. Uh, it should not uh, start more than once every 10 minutes. Okay, geothermal wells and water sources, pressure tanks operation. Notice that the air charge station on these uh, um, um, cylinders are Schrader valves. And notice that we have, uh, if you look at, uh, this is figure 44.24 in your textbook, uh, the operation of a well system pressure tank. A is the factory air charge. B has, has been pressurized to an air charge and water pressure is 50 PSI G. The well pump will now shut off because the pressure switch is open on a rise in pressure. On uh, the uh, pressurized tank in uh, illustration C, when the water is used by the heat pump, the pressure in the air uh, charge pushes the water into the system. The pump stays off. The well water, excuse me, the well uh, pump only comes on when the pressure switch closes on a drop in pressure. So basically this acts as a reservoir and a feed station to uh, ensure that we have a continuous water flow through the uh, uh, geothermal heat pump system. And the pump should only come on uh, very uh, once every, you know, um, one time, once uh, every 10 minutes or so of operation or less, depending on the size of this uh, uh, pressure uh, tank. And of course, we want to remove the air non-condensables. Uh, uh, basically, you have a Schrader valve installed at the top of the tank. Water to water heat pumps. Utilizes two coaxial uh, heat exchangers configured as either open loop or closed loop system. Common to see a buffer tank installed on the condenser water side to prevent high head pressure and to function as a water supply tank for the radiant heating system. The formula for the buffer tank volume is volume or buffer tank equals uh, T and in the parentheses you have Q which is the heat pump minus the uh, space divided by the delta T times 500. Water to water heat pump configurations. If you look at 44.26, the heat exchanger configuration on a water to water heat ex heating system. So basically, uh, you still have a compressor, still have an evaporator, still have a condenser, you still have a TXV. Now, what changes here? Now, for the evaporator, we are now circulating uh, a refrigerant. Uh, basically, we are circulating a refrigerant or water, in this case, a fluid, into the ground. And the nominal ground soil temperature is 50 degrees. So basically, uh, we will circulate the warm water into the ground loop. And of course, coming back, it comes as a uh, cooler uh, 45 degree water. And in the condenser, uh, basically, we have the uh, uh, from the load utilizing a circulator and to the uh, load. So basically, we have a, a refrigeration system, but we are utilizing the earth as the heat exchange point instead of the surrounding air. So the buffer tank is going to be located on the water to water heat pump system. Notice how that thing is located over here to the right hand side have a circulating pump. And again, you got your evaporator, your condenser, your compressor, and your metering device. And remember, the heat that is picked up in the evaporator is rejected, in this case, to the uh, earth heat exchanger. Troubleshooting. Similar to methods that are used to air air heat pumps, ground loop pressure, ground temperature, excuse me, and temperature readings are needed. Temperature probe measures the temperature difference between the inlet and the outlet of the water's heat exchanger. Pressure gauge used to determine the pressure drop across the heat exchanger helps to determine the flow rate through the heat exchanger. 
troubleshooting of the refrigerant and electrical circuits of the geothermal pumps are similar to other refrigeration systems. Ground loop uh, water loop uh, provides a means for water to refrigerant heat exchange. Uh, the governing formula is the heat quantity in BTUs per hour equals GPM, gallons per minute, times the temperature differential times 500, which is a constant. The variables in the GPM, gallons per minute of antifreeze solution, and the temperature difference. If either changes the heating and or cooling capacity, the heat pump will be affected. Okay, this slide, we talk about low antifreeze uh, flow rate can be caused by a defective circulating pump. Believe it or not, pumps are mechanical and they do wear out. Air restriction of piping, if your piping uh, water loop is air bound, you are going to have problems circulating to the correct gallons per minute flow. Contaminate or kink pipe in a closed loop system, low water supply pressure in an open loop, signs of a reduced antifreeze flow in the heating mode, low suction pressure, large temperature differential. Signs of reduced antifreeze cooling, high head pressure, large temperature differential between the inlet and the outlet, signs of mineral deposits in the heat exchanger open loop, that is definitely a problem. If you have a, min a heavy, heavily laden mineral water circulating through the heat exchanger, they will tend to uh, calcify and uh, solidify over time and your heat exchange is going to be affected. Uh, lower than usual temperature differential, high head pressure in the cooling mode, low suction pressure in heating mode. Direct geothermal heat pump systems. In this case, now we're bearing refrigerant lines into the ground. Copper pipes act as the evaporator, often called a refrigerant loop. In the heating mode, the heat is absorbed from the earth directly into the vaporizing refrigerant. Cooling mode, uh, conventional air cool condenser is used. So we use one part for the heating and then we use a conventional air cool condenser on the other side. Direct geothermal heat pump systems, installation refrigerant loop piping. Installation costs are lower than a standalone geothermal system. The existing condensing unit acts as the pump and the uh, uh, heat generator. Copper loops are buried about three to four feet below ground. No buried joints underground. Uh, loops are connected by brazing to a header. Existing refrigerant lines are tapped for connections. Once again, we have no brazed connections. The loop is going to be solid copper in and out. Okay, direct geothermal heat pump systems configuration continuing. Uh, the earth loop, the refrigerant loop may be three different configurations, diagonal, vertical, or horizontal. Uh, loops that are connected to a refrigerant distributor or manifold which divides the divides the refrigerant flow equally to each loop. Manifold is connected to the heat pump's compressor unit. Direct geothermal heat pump systems, non-retrofit application. A standalone direct geothermal heat pump system utilizes the earth loop piping in both the heating and the cooling modes. Heating mode, the heat is transferred from the warmer earth into the refrigerant loop. In the cooling mode, refrigerant temperature of the refrigerant uh, earth loop is higher than that of the earth and is transferred to the earth. So as long as the temperature is higher, this is viable and it does work. Direct geothermal heat pump systems, refrigerant management uh, system consists of two components, liquid flow control and active charge control. The three main objectives is to improve the system efficiency, reliability, and serviceability. Continuously return lubricating oil back to the compressor without returning liquid refrigerant. Stabilize the liquid and vapor refrigerant flow in long refrigerant earth loop runs. Direct geothermal heat pump systems liquid flow control replaces all other expansion devices, regulates the um, uh, rate of ref liquid refrigerant flowing from the condenser to the evaporator by responding directly to the amount of vapor bubbles arriving at the control from the condenser's outlet. E 
The end result is a larger condenser with lower condensing pressures, lower compression ratios, and higher system efficiencies. Direct geothermal heat pump systems, active charge control, ACC. This is a thermally insulated reservoir that replaces the standard accumulator. The purpose is to constantly deliver refrigerant vapor and oil to the compressor in the optimum conditions and quantities. Acts as a reserve of refrigerant. Determines when the system is properly charged without using gauges, wet or dry bulb readings, or charging charts. Well, that's a new one. 